Okay, while, while we're uh, working on this particular technological issue, would, would some of you, let, let me just say this, again, by way of introduction. Uh, Sarah and I are not the experts on this subject. We are people who have been thinking about this, collaborating, and trying to figure out how to find um, more scolae in our school. Some of you have been doing the same thing. Uh, some of you have found some, some activities, um, some ways of, of doing te uh, uh, teaching. Oh, I see Sarah's just appeared. Great. Hello. Hello, Sarah. Hi. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm good. You can hear me okay? I think this is going to be fine. Uh, let me just do a little test here and ask, would somebody uh, just confirm that you can hear and see Sarah? Good. Irina has done that for us. Thank you. Good. All right. Now we can, uh, we can, I'll finish with my introductory statement and we'll just get started with some, some uh, additional, uh, some, some questions. Uh, so I was just saying that s uh, neither Sarah nor I have uh, really arrived on this subject. Uh, we had a conversation about a month ago where we were talking about how in many ways we feel like we're, we're still beginning to, to understand what it means to, to be at rest while we're, while we're educators. Uh, there's something about educating our own children that requires a lot of work. It's not, it's not a cakewalk. It's, it's not all ease. It does involve a lot of hard work. And yet it seems to me that uh, uh, shalom or peace should characterize all that we do. And the tradition of classical education does speak to this, not in every thread, but there is a, there is a significant thread in the tradition that says that learning can be restful because it, it also involves contemplation and a poetic way of knowing things, not merely a rational way of knowing things. And so as we've been trying to recover the tradition, we've been thinking about that and then trying to translate that and apply it to our own homeschools and schools. But many of us are just starting that. Some of you have been doing this yourselves for some time and, and have some insights to share. So as we get started here, some of you uh, should just share some some activities and pedagogies that you've employed that have made a difference so that everybody can be informed and and, and helped and blessed by by what you've discovered so uh, be ready to go ahead and, and write some of those things down in the chat box okay well let's trans transition now to Sarah Sarah would you just tell a little bit about your story tell us uh, how it is that you became interested in in, in Scole learning and even to write a book about it and describe how uh, you describe yourself as kind of the the um, the anti example of a restful of a restful <laughs> educator and had to yeah. so tell, us, tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to this point where now it's a concern for you absolutely um, well I I certainly did not intend to write a book I did not set out to write a book or even a blog series which is what it started as um, what what happened was I was pregnant with twins, so I had six kids, uh, a ten or 12, 10, and 8, and then a two-year-old, and now um, the identical twins are 10 months. So I was um, expecting the twins and was listening to an interview Andrew Kern from the Searcy Institute gave uh, at a homeschool conference. I, it was recorded on YouTube, and I was listening to it while I was organizing a closet, and she closed the interview by saying, asking him, what is the one most important thing a homeschooling mom needs to know? And he said, without missing a beat, he said, teach from a state of rest. And I mm -hmm. thought, wait, <laughs> what? I mean, it just sort of blew me away right out of the gate. You know, what is that? But it resonated with me. Something about that really made me think, I'm not doing that. That's not what we have here, but that's what I really, really want. And because I process things by writing, I began writing about it. And so, that what I was writing kind of turned into a, a blog series and so I put that up on my blog but as I was writing and listening to what people were saying in response to that I just kept writing and realized it wasn't it wasn't a series anymore now it was a book and so that's where the book came from but really it's it's not something that I have mastered or even even gotten close to mastering at all myself I feel like I'm just on the journey like like everybody else but it's something that I really long to do mm -hmm. So, how did that longing translate to some changes in behavior? What, what were some of the, 
maybe one or two or three things that you began to do differently as you contemplated uh, a scholarly approach to education? Well, um, your series, Dr. Perrin, on scholarly and restful teaching, your and your um, eight, which I think might now be ten, is that right? Principles of classical education, is that right? It's growing. Yes. Um, you. One of the things you said in there was to do less. To and maybe it, well, maybe it was on a podcast at, at Quiddity, um, for Quiddity, the Thursday Institute podcast. But um, you said to do less, to take on less at a time. You know, if we're trying to track 10 or 12 subjects at a time, that is crazy making all of its own. So that's probably one of the first things I did was stop and think. Well, and this was necessitated too because the final stages of twin pregnancy are pretty intense, so you can't really do a whole lot. And then um, when we had the twins, I mean, that was just crazy. <laughs> So um, it was sort of a necessity paired with this understanding that if we want to be less um, crazy, you know, in our homeschooling, then we need to pair back. So I stopped and really thought about what is the most important thing that we can, um, we can do in our schooling that make the biggest impact. And a lot of that came through the different principles that you have in your series one of which, I don't know if it's this whole principle or not, or if it's just something you touched on, but it's integrating. And so making sure that the things that we are getting to in our school day um, are integrated across the curriculum so we can understand that they're not just hitting one um, skill set or subject or need, but Latin, for mm -hmm. example, hitting across so many important parts of the curriculum. So mm -hmm. that's probably where I started. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting that you could start with this idea that um, education can be an integration of subjects under, say, one art, like Latin. Because Latin, it, it, if it's an art, it really is um, kind of trans-curricular, right? If you're, if you're really studying an art like grammar or logic or Latin, um, it's going to have its hands in everything that you do. And so the more that we recover an art, we begin to realize boy, this is really for all of life. It's for all of learning. It's not relegated to one silo. So you started to break out of those silos a little bit and see that the study of an art like, like Latin could actually be connected to virtually anything you did during the day. Um, that might be hard sometimes to, to integrate art with mathematics, but, but you still do begin to see how these, these arts are very much interrelated. And I think that's a part of the challenge of our own educations is we were not given an integrated education, mm -hmm. were we? Right. So for us to begin to integrate learning ourselves when we have been so fragmented is a challenge. Yeah, I think that's and I'm sure there's a lot my of own biggest obstacle is feeling like I start teaching the way I was taught. Or the deep, my default is to do exactly what was done to me sort of in education or the way that education was approached for me is the way that I end up defaulting toward in my home unless I'm really, really carefully thinking it through and changing the way that happens. And, and how do you do that? Because I think that is that is a really difficult obstacle. How, do you, how does a leopard change its spots? Yeah. So how do, how, how, what have you been able to do? What's happened in your life, Sarah, that, that's giving you some encouragement that you can actually begin to become a different kind of educator? And what has to happen, what happens even when you're not teaching that enables you to begin to teach from a state of rest? Uh, I think the most important thing is, um, I think the first step for me and for anyone who wants to really take on the idea of teaching from rest is accepting or surrendering. Um, I think we kind of have this tendency to feel like we're in control of everything and realizing mm -hmm. that um, our homeschools aren't going to be perfect, our kids' educations aren't going to be perfect, and so uh, accepting the fact that it's just not and that that even so God can make something beautiful out of the education we give our children and then I think educating mm -hmm. ourselves or cultivating school a in our own selves as moms is huge so I think probably on a practical end one of the very first things we can do as um, mothers who want to teach from a state of rest is to sort of cultivate this leisurely kind of education of our own separate from the curriculum separate from what we're doing with our kids yeah boy um let's just back up just for a minute sarah there's probably a few people out out there 
who have heard us talking now about Scola and, and RESTful learning and are still wondering a little bit about what it is that we're talking about. Um, so let's, let's take a dip back to kind of the philosophy of approach and then, um, then let's move, move over to practices again. But let's just kind of go philosophical for a moment. Um, we don't want to stay there for too long. <laughs> we want to show how philosophy and practice are, are integrated. Um, but there's, um, there's probably a few people who just need a, a thumbnail sketch as to what restful learning is. So why don't you take, and I know it has, it has several dimensions, but why don't you take one dimension or another that comes to your mind about what Scully or restful learning is and, and describe that for everyone. Okay, the first thing that comes to mind for me is just a leisurely delighting in, in what you're learning about. So mm -hmm. is instead of take, putting the priority on checking off a lesson or getting through a certain number of math lessons, for example, would be to in, really delight in, enjoy, and just kind of hang out with a uh, math concept for a while. Really just steep yourself in it and delight in it. That concept or that um, delighting in, I think, is really, really important. Um, and it's really important to the idea of resting because um, Joseph Pieper's book, Leisure, um, the Basis of Culture, makes a really good point for what leisure is. And I think a lot of us, you know, we don't have the right understanding of what leisure is. And so when we hear leisurely education, we think that means not academically rigorous or not, um, not a good, thorough, solid academic education. But that's not what we mean. Um, we mean an education that is something that you would want to learn about or want to dig into even in your free time because it's so invigorating. And so that's probably the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of Scolé um, is education that is sort of based on this loving what that loving what is lovely. Mm. Uh, I think that's just really well said, and I'm going to now do an advertisement for the book that Sarah mentioned, which is Leisure: The Basis of Culture. Um, you know, we're all standing on the shoulders of other people, and here's one giant to jump on the shoulders of, uh, Josef Pieper, German, German theologian, wrote this book in German, translated it into English, wrote it in the 40s. It's a little tough going at first because of maybe the language, and it is, he is a philosopher as well, but it's so well worth reading the first 100 pages of this. Um, if you want to recover the tradition of restful learning, here's one of the first great places to go, uh, Leisure, the Basis of Culture. And let's just talk about that word for a moment, scolé, because one way to define something is just to look at its etymology, and it's a very interesting etymology. Um, we, it's a Greek word, and we get our word school from it. Uh, the Latin word scola, the German word skul. Uh, am I right, Isabella, that skul means uh, is school in, in German as well? I know there's some other words in German for, for, for school. But what's interesting is that in, in the Greek mindset, scolé did not mean the kind of schooling that we've had. It really meant um, restful learning. It meant contemplation. It meant conversation. Aristotle talks about this in the politics, and he says that all learning really begins in scolé, which means this idea of coming to love something and engage it in conversation, often with friends, um, with time. Right, And here's perhaps one reason why the English word leisure is often used to translate scolé, because it takes time. If you delight in something, as Sarah is saying, um, you want to take time with it. Yeah. You want to linger over the things that you love, even a good cup of coffee, for goodness sake. You want to drink it slowly, although you go, you Italians tend to just drink that cappuccino too quickly, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> but you want to linger over the things that you love. And this gets to this idea of uh, a knowledge, a poetic learning, meaning that language that comes from the making of something and the engagement of something that is not merely a rational activity. And so um, in our culture, learning is mainly rational. And in our American public school system, the main pedagogy is preparing for a test or test prep in which you cram, test, forget, and then go on and repeat the process. And so many of us have been through a system where we've done that, that when we're tired, we tend to just teach the same way. So to start imagining teaching a different way can be challenging. But isn't it true, Sarah, that there were times in your life 
when you did experience uh, that kind of education where you were engaged in really delighting in something and lingering, lingering over it, contemplating it, and, and was there a teacher in your life in the past who to some degree embodied this approach to education, at least from time to time? Yeah, I think I had. Or can you think of some experience? Yeah, I think so. And I think the key that I noticed um, when I think back to that and think of which teachers maybe uh, embodied more of that idea of school in their teaching were the ones who were really enthusiastic about what they were teaching. So, you know, they wanted to be there and they were so excited about it that you knew that they would want to be there even if they weren't getting paid to do it kind of a thing. In other words, in various ways, you saw them loving the things that were lovely right in front of you, didn't you? Right. Right. There was a kind of a, so there was a modeling going on where they were clearly in love with with something beautiful and good and true. And it just, you caught it sometimes more than it was taught. Right. And I think actually I've, I've experienced that as a homeschooling mom too. Um, this year we've been working through Ken Ludwig's How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. And man, that book just it just revved me up about Shakespeare. And I've been having, I'm kind of an enthusiastic person anyway, but it's been, my enthusiasm over Shakespeare has been exploding. And as a result, my 12, 10, and 8 year olds are just really, really digging the whole, I mean, we're, we're watching reproductions and reading stories and memorizing passages, and they're really into it, far more than they would have been about a lot of the other things that we've learned. Uh, together, so I think that's been indicative to me of okay, this is something. This is what we're talking about here. This is what we need to harness. And that's that's great. Hey, Robert, if I could have your help for a moment, I'm thinking I might just uh, expand the uh, visual field for these. If that's okay. Can I do that with uh, the video? Make them larger for people. Yeah. Um, let me go under workspace. Okay, maybe. Try conference. That's where we were. Okay, let's try this one. Conference. There we go. Um, boy, I don't like looking at that big of an image of myself, but it might be helpful for for <laughs> our viewers. Um, yeah. You go, go, go. Um, all right. Before we go further, let me just. Uh, oh, I appreciate the uh, the people who appreciate what we've just done. Um, I want to say to our viewers, uh, we want you to ask some questions of Sarah too, all right? So uh, I'm not going to ask you to write those questions down now, but in a few minutes I'm going to ask you to put a, a question down for Sarah. And with 100 people viewing, we're not going to be able to answer each one, but we'll certainly choose some, some good questions that we hope will be representative for most of you. So be prepared with your questions. You might be thinking about what question you want to ask even now. But I'm going to ask Sarah one more question myself before we do that. Sarah, in your book, um, and, and give us the title of the book, and do you have a copy of the manuscript close close by by any chance? That would have been helpful. I have it on it, my computer here I can I can click to. <laughs> it's called Teaching let's, let's from try West. Can What's that? Can we uh, share a screen? Can she share her screen? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Or do I have to give her a Second, Sarah, I might have to give you permission to do that. Okay. okay. Pull it up here. Oh, okay. We won't be able to do that, Sarah. But you know, okay. uh, uh, Rebecca can give get a get a copy if you wouldn't mind. We're going to get a copy of uh, your book, okay. and we'll just show uh, in front of the camera. Um, but the title of it again is? Teaching from Rest, A Homeschooler's Guide to Unshakable Peace. And it's an ebook. It's not long. It's, I didn't want to make it um, overwhelming. And I really didn't want to make it any longer than the message I felt like um, I was sort of grappling with myself. So it's a shortish. I think it's about 100 pages in the PDF. Um, it's also available for Kindle on Amazon. And then um, the thing I'm really excited about with it um, is that I created a companion to go with, and that includes a printable journal that sort of t pulls out the principles out of the book and so that people can work through that themselves and um, help them apply the principles to their own situation in the context of their own lives. And that also includes four audio lectures, or not lectures, conversations. One with you, Dr. Perrin. We, you and I talked about Skolay, 
merciful learning, and one with mm -hmm. Andrew Kern from the Searcy Institute. Um, and he talked about, you know, he's often talking about teaching from a state of rest, and so uh, he went into that specifically for homeschoolers a little bit more in that conversation. I talked to Cindy Rollins, which a lot of you probably are familiar with her. She's one of my favorite mentors. Um, she blogs at ordo-amoris.com, and we talked about now she's um, almost done homeschooling all nine of her children, and so from that perspective, what she wishes she had known to help her teach from a state of rest when she was in her earlier in her journey. And then one more with Brandy Bensel, who blogs at afterthoughtsblog.net, and she's also a part of the auxiliary board at Ambleside Online. And she and I talked about the nitty gritty, you know, how busy homeschooling moms can make room for rest in their lives, make it a priority in their homeschools. And um, she's uh, pretty knowledgeable about Charlotte Mason, so how Charlotte Mason's ideas and methodologies fit in there. All of that is, okay. you can find at teachingfromrest.com. So. Excellent. Um, we're going to be able to pull up a PDF of your book in, in just a second here. Um, I, I read with interest your chapter on curriculum. Um, yes. You say that a curriculum uh, is, is, is not, the curriculum is, is uh, not something that you just teach, but something that you do. And you, you talk about the different ways that we use the word curriculum. Yeah. Uh, and I remember, I know you're sensitive to the fact that if, we, if we're so focused on a curriculum that it becomes just a list of boxes that we check mm -hmm. off, that, yep. that starts to work against restful learning. Could you, could you talk about that a bit? Yeah. Um, one of the things I think we homeschooling moms have a tendency to do, I have a tendency to do it, and I think a lot of homeschooling moms do, is get, we overestimate what published resources can do for us, or what printed, what we think of as curriculum, you know, Saxon Math, or Latin for Children, or um, our writing program, whatever we're using, we have this tendency to think that if we can get through this material from beginning to end and check all the boxes in between, then that means that our child has gotten their, a good education. And so we overestimate, because that is not what, the, that's not what a published resource can do. A book can't really educate our child. An idea can edu educate our child. And as teachers, we can help them dig into those ideas. But um, I think my, my biggest point in the chapter, curriculum is not something you buy, is that we've got to let go of the idea that just because we've checked all the boxes or flipped all the pages in a book doesn't make for an education. It's, um, it's bigger than that, and that should free it. Sometimes that feels a little intimidating. Like, I just want to follow the recipe from, you know, with all the ingredients and all the amounts and come out with my cake perfectly baked. But that's, we're dealing with people, you know, little images of God, and that's just not how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is such a, a, it's a, it's a critical component. And, uh, and is this what everyone sees? I believe. Okay, can, I, can you folks see the uh, copy of the, of the book now, Teaching from Rest? Someone can, okay, good, people can see that. All right, you can, I guess we can move that to the side now, great. So that's what it looks like, and as uh, Sarah said, you can get that via your typical sources, Kindle and so on. Um, and yeah, let's, by the way, we can delete it now. Thank you. All right, uh, I'd be nowhere without my trusty assistant, Rob, who you sometimes see and sometimes don't see. Thank you. <laughs> I need one. Yeah, because we, you know, <laughs> don't we all? Yeah. A curriculum is a, is you know the, the Latin word is a race course. It's a course that we run, but it isn't just. It's not. It's 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 not something we buy. <laughs> and I really appreciate the way you make that distinction. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's some folks out there who sometimes think, well, you know, I I got this curriculum, which I like to sometimes call a published resource. And gosh, I am teaching this curriculum, so I must be doing a good job with education. But really, um, a, a published resource is designed to serve us, and we're not to serve the published resource, right? In right. other words, Sarah, you are the educator, and you're looking for some helps and aids and resources, and that might be something that a publisher creates. But you're going to teach history, and you're going to teach Latin and mathematics. And you're going to try to ensure that your children love the truth, goodness, and, pu and beauty that's, that are contained within, say, mathematics. And, and it just changes. It's, it's a subtle distinction, maybe, but I think it's a profound one. It changes the way you understand what you're doing as a teacher. Yeah, I think it takes the focus off of, 
off of that book and it it changes it and so now our goal is to encounter ideas and master in and master that now i don't know if you master ideas or you just master skills and encounter ideas maybe that's a better way to say it boy so i wonder if there's some folks out there who are working around uh, struggling with that distinction because we need help and we're busy and it is hard to to be an educator and if you've had five or six children like like you do sarah <laughs> it's a tall order so we're looking for helps but sometimes the helps actually become the things that we serve rather than the things that serve us and this falls back to yet another profoundly important issue which is how do we embody a love for the subjects and arts that we're teaching and you said sarah that you're trying to find time as a mom an educator your own scole time your own ability to be refreshed sometimes i find that homeschooling educators the only thing they're studying are the things that they're teaching their children because there just doesn't seem to be time to do anything else you're trying to stay a chapter ahead of your kids um, how does a busy homeschooling mom find the ability to to find some rest even outside of your teaching duties so that you're being refreshed by the things that you're reading and things that you're studying yeah I think a lot of homeschooling moms primary hobby is homeschooling <laughs> and learning how to be a good homeschooler and and reading homeschooling forums and homeschooling blogs and those are all really fabulous but if that's what our children see then we really shouldn't be surprised when they're you know excited about video games and that's about it you know because they are seeing that we're just we're kind of limiting ourselves by the work that we need to do each day. And so, um, and so I think the first thing we have to do, and I'm working on this because I, like I said, have three children that are two and under, and um, so it makes it very difficult to find time for good solid reading or taking up my own hobbies. But I have um, looked for ways to replen say replenish, renew and rejuvenate myself um, and cultivate my own intellectual life um, that, work with family life so i'm really into photography and that's something i just discovered in the last couple of years i had no idea i was into photography and that's an easy one to integrate with motherhood because i can take pictures of my kids <laughs> um, and sort of cultivate it that way but um, i think partnering with other moms who are really interested and engaged and want to cultivate scole in their own lives is hugely important because then we can kind of lean on each other and toss around ideas and brainstorm ways to make it happen, maybe share childcare, you know, you watch my kids, I'll watch yours, that kind of thing. This last year, I have expressed to my husband my need to have some time to cultivate um, the thing, my own projects and things I'm interested in, and so we've been able to work in for me to have a mother's helper come once, once a week in the afternoon for a couple of hours. That's a huge blessing, and it's, never, it's not something that we've been able to swing before. But before we have mm -hmm. traded childcare or I got up really, really early and there's just ways to make it a priority. But I think the first step is realizing that it is a priority and it's not just something, well, you can read Peeper or um, Charles Dickens or, you know, learn how to knit or paint, watercolor paint or go on walks in nature or something if you have free time because you, you'll never get there. I mean, you can have one child, you'll never get there. There's always more to do. So it kind of takes mm -hmm. us back to that idea of Sabbath, you know, it, we don't just rest on the seventh day. God didn't rest on the seventh day because he was like burnt out, exhausted. And, you know, we don't rest on the seventh day because all the work is done. We just, we, we rest because that's the rhythm that he set for us. Mm -hmm. And it seems that in that Genesis account, rest is a form of delight. Um, God is delighting and enjoying um, creation. So, which just kind of circles back to your earlier comments about delighting in the things that are true, good, and beautiful. Um, and, and that just means we set aside time to do so. So, I, I sometimes, um, when I present on this topic, I, I often ask mainly homeschooling moms, you know, why is the violin in the closet? Um, why, why? Is there do you no longer do any watercolor uh, why aren't you studying French anymore um, because 
uh, our children need, in my view, to mod to truly model a love for the lovely, as you put it. Uh, we, our children need to see us delighting in things and and have and and continuing to grow ourselves uh, in areas that uh, are apart from you know Saxon math uh, five six. Uh, yeah. They need to see that we're reading Dickens' novel, that we're going off to our own piano lesson occasionally, or yeah. you know we're um, we're working with our photography uh, to. That that itself communicates so much to our children about what it means to be a human being who's growing in our humanitas as image bearers, uh, a delighting, delighting in the true, the good and the beautiful, um, given our own gifts and calling. So while I think we do have to be certainly primarily engaged in, in homeschool education, if that's what we're called to do, this is a big part of it. And I'd like you to talk, um, and then we'll have to go to some questions here because I see questions that are already good popping up. Yeah. But you are excited about this idea of Skole sisters, getting homeschooling moms together who find Skole time, as it were, for themselves um, for, for a few hours, maybe every couple of weeks. Talk about your vision for that. Well, Skole sisters is a project that we are in the process of getting ready to launch, um, inspired by you, Dr. Perrin, and what you have written about Skole and some moms that you had mentioned in a blog post who were meeting on a regular basis to, I think, read, is that right? To read good literature and talk about books? Read, read, and, read and talk, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and have not, good food and drinks. Yeah, right. And not reading more about how to homeschool, but reading um, like the classics, right? Is that right? That's um, right. So that blog post inspired me because I thought, we need this. And homeschooling moms, we need this because we really, I think, most homeschooling moms work really, really hard and are really, really dedicated to giving their children the best education possible without realizing that a huge piece of that is the teacher and so cultivating themselves as the teacher. And so I rallied a few of uh, my friends and we started working on scolaysisters.com, which should uh, launch in July. That's the plan. We're working really hard to get everything ready behind the scenes um, for that. And it's going to be a place where women can get ideas for how they can create, with local women in their area, um, gatherings of some kind, either on a monthly or a quarterly basis, whatever works for their group, um, to scole together and to really cultivate their own delight in the arts or maybe go on nature walks together and maybe learn how to watercolor, maybe dive into Dickens and um, Char I, keep I keep mentioning Charles Dickens. I want to read David Copperfield. That's why. <laughs> um, but, you know, some beautiful pieces of literature. That will be one piece. So cultivating ourselves as teacher. And then another piece for Escola Sisters is how to teach from rest and become the kind of, um, become worthy of imitation or really make our homeschools built on truth, beauty, and goodness instead of I think a lot of times, especially when it comes to classical education, that we homeschoolers tend to, I don't know, it's gotten co-opted by this idea of it just needing to be really hard or frantic or just these long lists of really hard books to read. And we forget what the real uh, foundation of classical education is. And so cultivating that in our homes. So we're launching that in July at scholesisters.com. So that's S-C-H-O-L-E, sisters.com. And we're going to start that with a, a series called You're More Classical Than You Think to help moms realize that they already have a lot of these things going on in their home um, and to kind of help them move the needle more in that direction. So uh, there will be lots of great things going on there. So you can, it's not open yet, but you can head to scholesisters.com and sign up to be on the email list. And that way when, we, when we've got the site live, you'll be the first to know. Excellent. Wouldn't it be great to just see a network of groups of four or five, six, seven moms uh, gathering together biweekly or monthly for this purpose, for encouragement, for their own uh, growth and delight? Um, I think we need that, and I think our our children need to see us living that kind of life. Yeah. So. That's just a great practical idea for how we can try to realize some of these ideals um, in our own, our own homes and and callings. Well, let's take let's take a moment and uh, scan some some questions here, Sarah. And I'm I'm going to let you choose some. So now's the time. I know some of you have been dropping in questions, and and Sarah, you can use the scroll bar if you like. Okay. 
and um, pick one, and then maybe just uh, uh, read the name of the person who's asking the question, and uh, and 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 uh, address it. Well, I see Ann Brown has asked a question that I think I saw up above a few times too, which is the basically um, well, what she writes is our state university system has a set of required subjects that must be covered in high school in order for a student to be admitted to high school. And this makes for a lot of box checking. How do you suggest balancing teaching and learning what is lovely against what the state requires for university admissions? And how then do we balance this with the testing culture that is so prevalent in education? So, well, Dr. Perrin, you should probably address the high school component because I don't have any high schoolers. But I can say, I know I saw a few people comment above that about you know how do we balance this whole idea of loving that what's lovely and delighting and learning and stopping the box checking madness with state requirements and what we're required to do. And I think a lot of that just comes with um, creatively re reworking, rethink, or thinking about our curriculum in a different way. So it depends on the state you live in. I know that some states have a lot of requirements. I live in Washington state. We have, I don't know, we have some requirements we have to do, not quite as much as those of you who live in New York, for example, but I think, um, in my state, at least, I know I don't have to give a detailed description of everything we've used for every skill we've learned. And so if my state says that we have to have a year of, um, uh, drawing a blank now, but a certain skill, then I may just acknowledge that we learn that skill in a different way than a traditional classroom does. And so um, getting through a year of math might not look like checking off um, 180 math lessons in my Saxon math workbook. To me, getting through a year of math may be working on math every day for a year. And whether or not my child gets through through the book or whether we just encounter math every day. Um, so I think I'm allowed to do that. I don't know how that looks in those states that have stricter requirements. So I'm, I'm not sure, if, Dr. Perrin, if you have some more suggestions from that. And then specifically as to high schoolers, boy, I don't know. My oldest is 12. Okay. Well, I think, um, you know, we, we don't want, you know, in, when we're emphasizing leisurely, restful learning, it's, it's, it could be easy for someone to misinterpret some of these comments to think that you really don't pay any attention at all, at all to acquiring skills in a systematic, progressive way. Right. That's not the case. We're really trying to correct an overemphasis, an exaggerated emphasis on box checking that is at the expense of really encountering learning, mastering, and loving arts and skills and, and knowledge. Uh, because when you forget 75% of what you're being taught in a typical didactic fashion, why, why are we going through that process? And that's what happens in most most of our American schooling today is we f we're not really even retaining what's being presented because of the way it's being taught and how it's being assessed. We're lodging things in our short-term memory and then it's lost. How many of you have had a entire high school courses on subjects that may, you, may, may not, you may not even be able to remember the name of the course, let alone the content. And that's true even at the college level. So we're trying to correct an exaggeration. There is a place, nonetheless, for tracking how you're doing and acquiring skills in a progressive and logical way. So really we're just describing a balance here. So certainly if you're moving, if you're teaching your child mathematics, say you're teaching addition and subtraction to a youngster, you want to see those skills acquired and you might be using some published resource to help you and to some degree you might be mentally checking off maybe even physically checking off some things but that has been so much overemphasized that it's distorted our whole process so it's okay to say yes i've checked off this i have taught addition i have taught subtraction and we've moved into long division and we've mastered that but but your overall pedagogy and approach won't be merely to check off boxes right. uh, you'll want your child to fully understand and love and appreciate uh, mathematical sense and numeracy and seeing the world in a mathematical way, delighting in math. And the way you do that is a lot different than just passing out worksheets and tests. So it involves uh, poetic knowledge as well, actually experiencing mathematics in some ways that transcend your typical published resources. Um, if we had time, maybe we could explore some of that. That's, that's a part of the ent entire recovery of classical liberal arts education is to make education, once again, an encounter with the true, the good, and the beautiful through the, through the liberal arts and the great, book, great, great works of literature. 
by a, a long standing lifelong contemplation and discussion of them. That's how we acquire virtue and wisdom. And so when our, when our curriculum outcomes are no longer just to check off a box, but to say, is my son loving yeah. mathematics and understanding mathematics and enjoying mathematics? And is he growing in virtues like humility and love and constancy and temperance? And is, is he growing slowly more wise? You know, there isn't a, there isn't a very, there isn't an effective published um, multiple choice exam that can help, uh, help assess those things. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, uh, I, I know I there's more to all of these. Too, that, um, I love checking boxes, and I love making lists and checking them off. And we, um, what you said about systematic learning is really good because, you know, my kids use, um, well, you, we are learning Latin, and you can't learn Latin well if it's not done systematically. And the same thing for math. And we work through a book from beginning to end, checking off each lesson as we go. But I think the idea of um, just that subtle shift in your mind from today we're going to do math, not today we're going to do lesson 97, you know, come hell or high water, we're going to get to the end. <laughs> and um, it, it, there's a, it, it's freeing in its own right just by changing your um, perspective, your goal, really, from, from I'm going to finish this lesson to I'm going to encounter math today and I would like to master it, it as we go. And so it's definitely not against systematic learning, definitely not against making lists. I make lists at the beginning of every school year. I just amend them a thousand times along the way. And I think, um, I think changing the way that you assess your day or assess your year, now it's not, we're not successful because we got through the entire curriculum. We're successful, our year is successful, or our student is successful because we have spent time delighting in and learning, and wow, we'll look at the difference between what we've understood and encountered from September to what we understood and encountered in May. Mm -hmm. That's uh, really well said, and uh, and worth a lot of reflection uh, by all of us. How, how do we create an environment in which uh, mathematics, to use mathematics as an example, is truly something that's encountered and enjoyed by our ch by our children? And that involves a large, a large um, collection of questions uh, from the way you would welcome students into a homeschooling uh, session to the, the way you contextualize mathematics all day long, even at the dinner table, because if it's an art that makes us more human, uh, then mathematics lives not just during the time when it's scheduled in your homeschool curriculum. It's, it's a part of your human experience. And it starts to kind of flow out of you, it should be. If we've really been educated in the art of mathematics as a, an adult, it can flow out of us at any time. That's but because problem. we were educated <laughs> in silos, mm -hmm. silos, and we, yeah. we haven't received an education, we struggle to know what that looks like. And this is another reason to do School Life Sisters. We need to be around people who are becoming more integrated to see what it looks like and to be inspired by them. Well, let's look at another question, okay. Sarah, and I'll let you choose again. Um, and if you want, you can scroll up too because there, there have been some questions that have already uh, okay. disappeared up on the top. Of the yes, and if you see one that I should get to that I missed, go ahead and let me know. Cause... Oh, my, someone asked what's my list of must daily subjects. I don't know if you're asking me or Dr. Perrin, but um, in our home, I prioritize um, math and the arts of language, basically. Those are, the, um, those are my my big one. So the arts of language meaning um, Latin and reading aloud together um, and teaching a child how to read. So if I got to nothing else, if I didn't do history or science or um, any of the other geography subjects um, separately, that's okay because we're encountering a lot of history and science and geography in our reading together and in their reading alone. But on a normal day, my kids have at least an hour to read um, to the, on their own, I, you know, whatever piece of literature, whatever they're going to read. Um, usually something like, uh, trying to think of what they're reading right now, but I, I'm drawing a blank. Basically an hour for them to read to themselves, at least an hour for us to read together where I read aloud to them. Um, hopefully that's been really challenging with a toddler, <laughs> two babies who are crawling. And, um, and then math every day and Latin. And so those are my, my hard 
these ones get done every day. I think some of those skills, like math and Latin, for example, are really difficult to do once or twice a week. You need to kind of do a little bit every single day. But even if you think, okay, all we've got done is 10 minutes or 15 minutes a day, if you did that for four days a week, that's, a, that's if, like if Andrew Kern says this in the companion to my book. He says 15 minutes, maybe it was you, Dr. Mary, <laughs> I can't remember. 15 minutes of focus attention is huge. Um, it really is a humongous feet. And so if you can do 10 or 15 minutes of focus attention on Latin, that's um, not a big time commitment, but it will go a long way over the course of the year. So those are my must-dos. Would you add anything to those must-dos, Dr. Karen? I think that's great. You know, the, um, you know, so, so there's a lot of ways to define a liberal arts curriculum, but uh, um, I know Martin Cawthorn likes to say it's, it's, uh, it's mathematics, um, the the trivium arts, the, the seven liberal arts, and the great books. Mm. Uh, so if you're doing grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and then you're doing the mathematical arts, and you're reading great literature, you're pursuing a strong liberal arts curriculum. I think it's a pretty good pithy definition of what a liberal arts curriculum is. But one overlay of that is uh, Augustine's point that you, and you've quoted him of loving the things that are lovely. And that's, a, that's at base what we're trying to do as human beings is enjoy God's creation. And he's made it such that we can understand it through language and through mathematics and through the great conversation of literature throughout history. That involves, of course, also the study of philosophy and theology, scripture uh, undergirding it all. But love is so important to anything that a Christian does that without it, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, we profit nothing. So. How does love infuse everything that we do, even the teaching of mathematics? And I think you could argue that since love is the chief virtue, if you are filled with love for, for your endeavors as a homeschool educator, you cannot but be at rest because love involves uh, being at rest. Uh, it, it, it just does. It means that you're properly related to the creator and redeemer. You're more properly related to creation. It creates a sense of well-being and, and fittedness. So if we're pursuing love, things just tend to kind of fall into place. So it's always good to, to ask that question. Am I doing this out of love? Am I teaching my kids to love mathematics? Now, Irina asked the question, what do we do? And it was up there somewhere when we have to ask our students to study something that they do not yet love. Because in an ideal world, our kids would wake up and say, Mommy, I love mathematics. Can, when, can we start right now? <laughs> yeah. And are on a journey. They're, they're children. They're growing. They don't always love the things that are lovely automatically. So what do you do in that situation like that, Sarah? Well, um, that's tricky. And I, that's something I've struggled with a bit myself. Um, my oldest daughter really hated Latin for the first um, solid year that we did it. And I tried to remind myself that usually we don't love things that are difficult for us until they become a little bit more, um, until we become better at them. You know, when I was learning how to play the guitar, which I, I didn't end up pursuing well enough to actually play anything worth listening to. Although I will say that my 10 year old told me the other day that I played the guitar beautifully, which I thought was hilarious because <laughs> but, but her perception is that I do. Um, but maybe there's something beautiful about mom playing the guitar. Maybe just making music together. Maybe, yeah. Let's yeah. go down that, that <laughs> Well, when I'm learning to play the guitar and I'm getting those blisters on the ends of my fingers and I can't get the right um, chord and it's difficult. It was hard for me every single day to think, oh, I should practice my guitar today. But once you start getting the hang of it, you can't wait to look, you know, you look forward to it. Sometimes I think it's a lot of just slogging through that early time. You know, it's kind of like eating their vegetables. Um, my kids do things they don't want to do every day, like math. <laughs> and, um, and I kind of try to keep light and make jokes about it, um, knowing that our, uh, our distaste for something that's beautiful, like math, is a, is a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a problem with us, not with the math. You know, and so it's kind of one of those things that I, I personally, when there's something that they hate doing, but they, I know is good for them, I just try to make light of it and we slog through anyway, and it doesn't always look pretty. And so it's not that my kids then laugh and do their math cheerfully, <laughs> not at all. But I think um, 
one of the misconceptions we have about homeschooling is that all of our days need to be like roses. You know, all of our days need to be happy sunshine, and that is not how I, I know lots of homeschooling moms. I don't know a single homeschooling mom who would say that even half of her days end up looking like a garden, you know. <laughs> so I think it's, there's a lot of it just sort of life lessons and slogging through something that's difficult. What I wanted to say about the Latin is that my daughter is, uh, she just finished her um, second year. This is her second? Yes, this is her second year of Latin. And at the end of this year, she loved it. It's one of her favorite subjects. And I really think it's because mm. she realized all of a sudden that she's quite good at it. And that, um, mm. and it's kind of fun to puzzle through a sentence and try and figure out which, um, you know, declension goes where or whatnot, whatever. So I think sometimes you just have to get through the beginning part and then then they can hmm. realize that maybe they enjoy it more than they realize they would. And I don't think that's always mm -hmm. going to happen, you know, but. No, I, I think this is, I think you've answered it very well, but I'd like to just tag something onto the end of that, because I think it's a critically important question. We do want our children to love these things, because once they love them, then they become a student. Because at, the, at root, a student is someone who's eager and zealous for knowledge and wisdom and virtue. And there's no published curriculum that just makes that happen. More than anything, I think it's our own modeling that has that kind of influence on students to change, to love the things that are lovely. But I think you're absolutely right to point out that there's a process and there's a journey that we undergo. And we can share our own narrative and story about this, that we too, like you shared the guitar analogy, we too have had to start uh, and move through steps that sometimes weren't as clearly enjoyable as they um, didn't, didn't, we didn't experience the delight at the beginning as we did at the end. But they need to believe us and trust us that this can actually happen. And now that your daughter's had this experience with Latin, it's very easy for you to say, this can happen with history as well, the next subject, the next endeavor. And that's actually cultivating constancy uh, in her so that the, you, you're building virtue into her own life by, her, uh, by, by this one experience, and she can extend that to others. Yeah, hopefully and, and she can also up against the subject that she doesn't like somewhere else. I can remind her. You know, remember when you didn't like Latin and you thought it was the worst thing ever. The other thing and, I and even for her. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> for siblings, I mean, she's a model to her brothers and sisters as well in that regard. Yeah. Go ahead. And I, I think um, Andrea asked just a second ago, how do we work subjects that we don't love? I hate Latin. She says, and I'm struggling to be enthusiastic. I should, I would be remiss not to mention that I got her a Latin teacher this year. <laughs> we joined a co-op where she was doing Latin with somebody who loves Latin. And I don't, I, it's not that I don't enjoy Latin. I never learned Latin, so I was learning kind of alongside her. And this year I was very distracted with babies. And so um, I didn't think I'd be able to give her the time and attention that I thought Latin required. So I went ahead and made sure we were in a group where there was somebody who loved Latin. And not, that's all, obviously not always um, possible, but if it is possible to find a teacher maybe you could barter with or something to teach the subjects. That same teacher also teaches science, which is great because that's the other subject that I'm the least enthusiastic about. So I think that's, um, I know Andrew Pudua from the Institute for Excellence in Writing often says that we should do whatever we can to try to outsource the subjects that we're really struggling to enjoy and, um, and then teach the things that we really delight in, so. And you know, you're just being a realist at that point. So sometimes classical educators can be too idealistic. Uh, it's okay to be aware of the fact that we have our limitations and we can't do everything that we, we might want to do, especially if we weren't classically educated ourselves. Yeah. So I think cooperative learning makes really good sense. And it's also, but I love your point about if, if there's a problem here, if I don't love Latin, that's not my, that's, that's my fault. You know, yeah. it's, maybe it's yeah. a fault of my education, fault of my teachers, but it's okay to face the reality and be honest about it. Yeah. But then to be able to say to your kids, you pray for me as well because this also is my struggle. Yep. Uh, I, but I know that, that Shakespeare is beautiful. I'm having trouble seeing it, and I need my own eyes to be open to see how lovely Shakespeare is. Yeah. Um, but let's not be idealistic and pretend that we, that we, we are all seeing things as clearly as we would like. We're all on that journey. So there's a room for some humility here to say, you know what, I'm groping to some degree. I'm trying to recover something that was not given to me. I'm not going to do it perfectly, and that's well, okay. It's helpful for our kids to see a struggle through that. I know lots of moms who really feel like they should be doing more nature study with their kids, um, like in the Charlotte Mason model, 
um, but they don't enjoy it at all. And I think, but they do it anyway, or they try to do it anyway. And I think it's great to be open with our kids and say, you know, I, I know this is good for me. And I know that creation is beautiful because God made it. And so I'm working on this alongside you. And to see that it's not, you know, that way they don't feel that way. They don't feel like something's wrong with them when they don't love math. They just realize that sometimes we are fallen people and we need to, um, our loves need to be shaped. Our affections need to be ordered. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take one or two more. We started just a little bit late, so we'll go just about another three or four minutes. Um, and I know some of you already have uh, commitments you have to leave, and if so, goodbye and thank you for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. But we're just, we'll take just uh, one or two more questions before we conclude. So. Uh, I'm scanning. I'm not seeing questions. I'm sure I'm going right over them. Oh, my typical Let's homeschool see, I, day. I, I see that one. Uh, my typical homeschool day um, <laughs> looks like chasing babies. And uh, <laughs> it looks a little bit like a zoo. Um, one of the things that always happens during our homeschool day, and I probably should have mentioned this with the subjects, but it doesn't seem like a subject to me, so I didn't, is morning time. And if you are not familiar with morning time, or some people call it circle time, Cindy Rollins, who I interview for the companion, blogs at ordo-amoris.com. She has a whole series on morning time. And basically, it was her idea of how to take all these kids of different ages, pull them all together, and to create a family culture around the true, good, and beautiful. And so they do things like mm -hmm. memorize poems and sing hymns and read Shakespeare and um, read the classics together. And so based on her recommendation, I've started making that of utmost priority. So usually our mornings do entail some um, an hour. I know Cindy has said that hers have gone anywhere from a half an hour to two and a half hours, kind of depending on the season of life they were in. And so ours don't go that long because we are, like I said, chasing babies. So they're pretty short. Um, but we have um, set meal times for breakfast and lunch and dinner. My kids have set chores, uh, short jobs that they need to do a few different times a day. And then we have a morning time and a math time and a quiet reading time. And afternoon, late afternoons, I try to keep kind of open so they can play with neighbor kids or out in the backyard or just pursue their own projects, that kind of thing. So I hope that answers that question. It reminds me, there's a, there's a group in the Cincinnati area that also formed their own Scola Sisters group. And mm -hmm. they, they were telling me recently that they created what they call a deep dive Monday. And Deep Dive Monday is when they allow their children, they negotiate with them at the beginning of the year, what, what subject or art they really want to give uh, extra time to. And the children choose that in consultation with the parents. And then on Mondays, they get to spend several hours studying an art that they're, they're, they're really passionate about. And that has created a rhythm that they really appreciate. So Tuesday through Friday, they're, they're doing um, something I have a different schedule, but Mondays are set aside to, to do a deep dive. I thought that was oh, nice. interesting. Yeah, I love the way you described Cindy's uh, ordering the day around the true good and beautiful. And I've heard of a number of families that are doing wonderful things in terms of changing their atmosphere, um, even lighting candles occasionally when they're studying scripture, mm -hmm. uh, starting the day with uh, beautiful music, um, uh, paying attention to aesthetics, the, the art that's around the house. Um, where where they're studying, um, the way they begin the day, uh, and, 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 um, involving some liturgical elements to the way their whole day is, is planned. Well, I wanted well, to um, see Corey there has asked about um, teaching a special needs child, and I don't have any experience with that yet, but, um, but I wanted to suggest that I know Memoria Press has come out with a book called Simply Classical. I was trying to pull it up so I could give you the author's name, but it's not pulling up for me. Um, but Memoria Sim Simply uh, Classical. Yeah, it's, it's actually um, listed there. Uh, let's see if I can highlight it there. Simply Classical, oh, yes, a I beautiful. Think somebody else mentioned it. Perfect. OK, good. I wanted to suggest that. I know that they have, she has some, um, quite a bit of experience. The author of that book has quite a bit of experience classically educating a special needs child. So that would be a good resource to look into. Excellent. Well, boy, I see that we're uh, just about 60 minutes out, so we probably should conclude to honor our time commitment. But um, it's always hard to do because uh, we want to just keep discussing these things. 
Um, and here we are talking about being frenetic. Uh, we, we hope you have a restful rest of the day uh, with what's coming. And we will be rebroadcasting this. This has been recorded, so we'll, we'll be placing it on the Classical Academic Press website if you want to uh, link to it later and share it with some others. Thank you. And I also just want to remind you that you can also be in conversation with Sarah at her blog, which is amongstlovelythings.com. We would be glad, both of us, to continue to engage you on this topic. And once again, we know that you, some of you, are even more advanced than we are when it comes to this area. And please share your ideas uh, any way you can so that we can continue to help people to, to engage in restful learning. Sarah, would you like to say anything by way of by way of saying goodbye. Yes, I just, the one thing that I really I always want to tell any time I hear a homeschool mom who's overwhelmed, because I'm really overwhelmed a lot of the time, is just that I think the most important thing we can do is to remember who we're working for. So when we put the state or SAT scores or college admissions officer or our neighbor or our children's grandmother, any of what we think they are thinking about us or their expectations as our guide, then we're going to be teaching in a way that matches the frenetic culture. We're going to be on the crazy train. It takes an act of faith to step off the crazy train and teach from rest and remember that we are working to serve God and God alone. And he would never give us more than he'll give us the, the help um, to, to, you know, teach our children in a way that pleases him. So try, try, and I will try to, I'll pray for you, pray for me, <laughs> to remember to, um, we're working for God, and he is right there at your elbow. Absolutely, and uh, I'd just like to conclude then by saying, Dona nobis pacem, may God uh, grant us peace. Uh, thank you for your work, and uh, we hope that we'll run into you one way or another, either in the flesh or online. Thanks again, and thank you, Sarah, for being with us.